French model breathes the muse tonight. The scene she draws is horrid, not polite. She dips her pen in terror, will ye shrink? Shall foreign critics teach you how to think? Had Shakespeare's magic dignified the stage, if timid laws had schooled the insipid age, had Hamlet's specter trod the midnight round, or Banquo's issue been in vision crowned? Free as your country, Britons, be your scene. Be nature now, and now invention. <clears throat> be vice alone corrected and restrained. Can crimes be punished by a bard enchained? Shall the bold censor back be sent to school and told, this is not nice, that is not rule. The French, no crimes of magnitude admit. They seldom startle, just alarm the pit. The tragic Greeks with nobler license wrote, nor veiled the eye, but plucked away the moat. Whatever passion prompted was their game. Not delicate, while chastisement was their aim. Electra now, a parent's blood, demands. Now parricide stains the Thebans' hands, and love incestuous knots his nuptial bands. Such is our scene. From real life it rose. Tremendous picture of domestic woes. If terror shake you or soft pity move, if dreadful pangs overtake unbridled love, excuse the bard, who from your feeling draws all the reward he aims at, your applause. These antique towers and vacant courts dull the suspended soul till expectation wears the cast of fear, and fear, half ready to become devotion, mumbles a kind of mental orison. I met a peasant and inquired my way, the churl, not rude of speech, but like the tenant of some night haunted ruin, bore an aspect of horror worn to habitude. None there, said he, are welcome, but now and then a pious mass priest and the poor, to whom the countess deal her alms on covenant, that each revolving night they beg of heaven the health of her son's soul and her own. What precious mummery! Her son in exile, she wastes on monks and beggars his inheritance for his soul's health. I never knew a woman but loved our bodies or our souls too well. Methought I heard a stranger's voice. What lack you, sir? Good fellow. Who inhabits here? I do. Be like this castle is not thine. Be like so. But be it whose it may, this is no haunt for revelers and gallants. Pass your way. Thou, churl, is this your Gallic hospitality? Thy lady, on my life, would not thus rudely chide from her presence a bewildered knight. Angels defend us, what a reprobate! Thou knowst my lady, then, thou knowst her not. Canst thou in hair cloths vex those dainty limbs? Canst thou on reeking pavements and cold marble 
in meditation past the livelong night? Father Greybeard, I cry thee mercy. Time was, my lord, the Count of Narbonne, a prosperous gentleman. Were he alive, we should not know these moping melancholies. Heaven rest his soul. I marvel not my lady cherishes his remembrance, for he was comely to sight and wondrous goodly built. They say his son, Count Edmund, is manly like him. What if I bring tidings of Count Edmund? Last night, the raven croaked, <laughs> and from the bars of our lodge fire flitted a messenger. I knew no good would follow. No, 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 he must not hear. Alas, I prithee, he must not hear set foot. Does my old master's heir still breathe? This vital heir. Is he in France? I would make a weary pilgrimage to kiss his gracious hands, and at his feet lay my old bones. But say, why Narbonne's heir from Narbonne's lands is banished, driven by a ruthless mother? Ah, sir, tis hard indeed, but spare his mother. Such virtue never dwelt in female form. But, sir, Count Edmund, being not sixteen, a lusty youth, his father's very image, I come to the point, her name was Beatrice. Hmm. Ah, Beatrice. A roguish eye, she never would look at me. Hmm. This Beatrice. But how? My lady comes. Retire a while beyond the yews, and I'll tell you more. Abbey, and prostrate o'er oh, some monumental stone, seems more to wait for her doom than ask to shun it. But hush, who moves up the other avenue? It is he, Benedict, my lady's confessor with Friar Martin. Quick, hide thee hence. Should that same meddling monk observe our conference, there were fine work toward Lodge her at Young Grange. I come to be there. <laughs> I tell thee, brother, this woman was not cast in human mould. Ten such would foil a council, would unbuild our Roman church. In her devotions real, she prays because she feels, and feels because a sinner. What is this secret sin, this untold tale, that art cannot extract, nor penance cleanse? Loss of a husband, sixteen years enjoyed, and dead as many. Could not stand such sorrow. My mind has more than once imputed blood to this incessant mourner, Beatrice, the damsel for whose sake in exile she holds her only son, has never, since the night of his incontinence, been seen or heard of. Tis clear, tis clear. I have oft shifted my discourse to murder. She notes it not. 
Her muscles hold their place, no sudden flushing, no faltering lip, I fix on love. The failure of the sex, an aptest cause of each attendant crime. Aye, brother, there we master all their craft. Still, brother, do you err? The Count, her husband, so adored and so lamented, won not her fancy, till the nuptial rites had with the sting of pleasure taught her passion. Then with a turn to worm her secret act. I know not that. Nay, one unguarded moment may disclose this mystic tale. Then, brother, what a harvest, or soon, or late, a praying woman must become our spoil. Her zeal may falter. I nurse her in new horrors. Form her tenants to fancy visions, phantoms, and report them. She mocks their fond credulity, but trust me, her memory retains their color. This is masterly. Oh, were I seated high as my ambition, I'd place this naked foot on neck of monarchs. By humbler art, our humble fabric rose, when power by craft. Wear it with ostentation. Gain to the Holy See this fair domain, and a crimson bonnet may reward your spoil. Never while Edmund lives. This steady woman can ne'er be pious with so many virtues. Justice is interwoven in her frame, nor will she wrong her son she will not see. She loves him not, yet his mistress of his fortunes usurped from her own wants. She sets apart a scanty portion only for her ward, young Adeliza. T'were wise to school this maiden. Lead the train of young ideas to a fancied object, a mental spouse. This is already done, but Edmund's death were hopes more solid. First, report him dead, the, his letters intercepted. Greatly thought. <laughs> Lo, where comes our patrons? Leave me. Alas, must guilt ground our very virtues? Grow they on sin alone and not on grace? While Narbonne lived, my fully sated soul thought none unhappy, for it did not think. Well, peace is fled, ne'er to return, nor dare I snap the thread of life. Eternity has scope enough to punish me, though I should borrow a few short hours to sacrifice to charity. I sought thee, lady. Happily I'm found. Who needs the widow's might? None asks your aid. Your gracious foresight still prevents occasion. No more of this, good father. I suspect none of your holy order of dissembling. Suspect not me of loving flattery. Will give me virtue. The church could seal your pardon, but you scorn it. Yours are pagan virtues. As such, I praise them, but as such, condemn them. Father, my crimes are pagan. Why shakes my soul with nightly terrors? Tis from within I tremble. Death would be felicity. What joys have I? I have lost my husband. My own decree has banished my own son. Last night I dreamt your son was with the blessed. Would heaven he were. Do you then wish his death? Should I not wish him blessed? Madam, I must not hear this language. You do abuse my patience. It ill beseems my holy function to give countenance by lending ear to such pernicious tenants. I am wrapped beyond my bearing. Your son is dead. Ah, father, we no prophetic demon bear within our breast but conscience. That has spoken. Tis that voice has told me. Tis my son's birth. Not his mortality must drown my soul in woe. Unjust, uncharitable as your words, I pardon them. Forgive me, father. Discretion did not guide my words. What peace is there for me? In the neighboring district, there lives a holy man whose sanctity is marked with wondrous gifts. Consult with him. Consult a holy man? Inquire of him? Good father, wherefore? What should I inquire? Must I be taught of him that sin is woe, 
Must I learn that minutes stamped with crimes of past recall, that joys are momentary and remorse eternal? Death alone can certify whether, when justice is full dues extracted, mercy shall grant one drop to slake my torment. Here, Father, break off. You to your calling, I to my tears and mournful occupation. Doubt not, my friend. Hardships of war have chased out the bloom of comeliness and stamped this face with harsher lineaments that well may walk, mock the prying of a mother's eye. A mother through whose firm nerves tumultuous instincts flood ne'er gushed to tell her, this is your son. If not her love, my lord, suspect her hatred. Hatred is distempered love. Why should she hate me? For that my opening passion's swelling ardor prompted a congenial, necessary joy? Was that a cause? No, Florian. She herself was woman then, a sensual woman. She might have pardoned what she felt so well. Forgive me, Edmund, nor think that I preach. You have often told me that night, the very night that to your arms gave pretty Beatrice's melting beauties, was the same night on which your father died. It is true. Wouldst thou have turned thee from a willing girl to sing a requiem to thy father's soul? I thought my mother busy with her tears while I stole to Beatrice's chamber. How my mother became apprised, I know not, but her heart grew estranged, estranged. Twas a trick of overacted sorrow, grief fatigues. Still must I doubt. Still deem some mystery, beyond a widow's pious artifice. But to me her hand is bounteous as her heart is cold. Narbonne's revenues are as fully mine as if I held them by the strength of charters. Why set them on the hazard, then? I am weary, Florian, of such a vagrant life. Befits it me, sprung from a race of heroes, Narbonne's prince, to lend my casual arms approved valor to quarrels, nor my country's, nor my own? I fought it but against the Turk, a holy war, so it was deemed. I smoked the turbaned race. Mattered it to me whether crescent or cross prevailed? True, my lord. Deadly feuds for obsolete offenses. Thy reproof, my friend, is just. But had I not cause, a tender cause that prompted my return, this cruel parent whom I blame and mourn has won my love. By winning my respect, she cannot surely, after such perils, wounds by her command encountered, after sixteen exiled years, spurn me when kneeling. Thinkest thou tis possible? I would not think it. But a host of priests surround her. They, good men, are seldom found to please the cause of pity. You shall be beggared that the saint your mother may by cowed sycophants and canting jugglers be hailed a new Teresa. Pray, be not seen here. Let's again to the wars. No, Florian. My dulled soul is sick of riot. Tis time to bid adieu to vagrant pleasures and fix the wanderer love. Domestic bliss. Ah, yes. Your fair pensioner. Young Adeliza has sobered your inconstancy. Tell me, is she fruitful? Pass we this levity. Tis true, Adeliza is beauty's type renewed. Is she kind? Cold as the metal bars that part her from me. <laughs> How gained you that admittance? This whole month, while waiting your arrival, I have haunted her convent's parlor. <sighs> Oh, Florian, union with that favored maiden might reconcile my mother. Hark, I hear voices that seem approaching. They cannot know me, see? these little suppliants their artless hands to heaven. You seem a stranger, 
For you could but know, Sir Knight, that Narbonne's pious countess dwells within, a lady most disconsolate. Her lord was snatched away in lusty life's full vantage, but no account made up, no absolution. Hence his reaping relic, or his spot of doom, a goodly cross erected. Thither we proceed to chant our holy dirge and offer due intercession for his soul's repose. I knew his son. Edmund? Where sojourns he? In the grave. Is Edmund dead? Say how. He fell at Budapest. And not to his dishonor. Sixteen fatal years has Narbonne's province groaned beneath the hand of desolation. For what crimes we know not. I feel your country's woes. I love that and revere his father's ashes. I will visit this ruined monument, and at our leisure could with some conference with you. This is well. Where is your heart? A mile without the town, hard by St. Bridget's Nunnery. There expect me. I must to Benedict. Return, my gracious lady. Though the storm abates his clamors, do not go forth. I saw the lightning burst on the monument, the shield of Narbonne's arms shivered to splinters, down with hideous crash the cross came tumbling. Then I fled. Hark, sure I heard a groan. Wretches like me, good Peter, dread no storms, tis my soul's proper language. Behold, she comes, a voluntary victim. Shade of my Narbonne, accept her destiny. Oh, head. for pity, gracious dame, what words are these? In any mouth less holy, there would seem a magic incantation. Last year's eclipse fell out because your maidens crossed a gypsy's palm to know what was become of Beatrice. Who knows, but sudden malady took off the damsel. Beatrice might or might not have sepulture within the castle wall. Peace, fool. Thy equivocation has stained my name with murder's foul suspicion. Things foreign rise and load me with their blackness. Erroneous imputation must be borne, lest, whilst unravelling the knotty web, I lend a clue may vibrate to my heart. But who comes here? Retire. Tis not far off the time the porter willed me to expect him here. O oh, Edmund, may my prosperous care restore thee to thy state, and aid thy love for Adeliza. Methought he spoke of love and Adeliza. Who can it be? I never heard his name. Stranger, did chance or purpose guide thy steps to this lone dwelling? Pardon, gentle lady, if curious to behold the pious matron whom Narbonne's plains obey, I sought this castle. Me, stranger, is affliction then so rare? None dwell here but melancholy, sorrow, and contrition. Pleasure has charms, but so has virtue, too. Your courtly phrase, young knight, bespeaks a birth above the vulgar. Mm. Lady, it is the hour of prayer. Stranger, I am summoned hence at St. Bridget's Monastery tomorrow night. Uh, if you can spare some moments from your pastime, I would Talk with thee in presence of the abbess. So this is well. My introduction made. It follows that I move her for her son. Women often wear the mask of piety to draw respect or hide the loss of it. While snuffing incense and devoutly wanton, the pagan goddess grows a Christian saint. Well, Edmund, whatsoe'er thy mother be, I'll put her virtue or hypocrisy to the severest of tests. Countess, expect me.
right. Well, <laughs> what of that? Were every thunderbolt addressed to me, no one would misweep me. We know the doom we merit. Fie, fie, I blush to recollect my weakness. My Edmund may be dead. My Adeliza may taste the cup of woe that I have drugged. What wretch could be a blacker criminal than I am? Were faggots placed around me and the fatal torch applied? Would it teach the world unheard of sins? How dare I be esteemed? Be known my crimes. My Edmund, has not a mother's hand afflicted him enough? Madam, young Adeliza entreats to speak with you. The Lady Abbess sickens to death. Admit her. Now, my soul, recall thy calm. Approach, sweet maid. Thy melancholy mien speaks a passionate and feeling heart. Oh, can I hear these praise and not fall in blushes at thy feet? Recall thy words. Thy Adeliza merits no encomium. I am not innocent. Oh, thou dearest orphan to my bosom, come. Purity like thine affrights itself with fancied guilt. In vain you cheer me. I am most unworthy. Other discourse than thine has charmed mine ear, nor dare I now presume to call thee mother. My lovely innocence, restrain thy tears. I know thy secret. No why beats and throbs thy little heart with unaccustomed tumult. Impossible. <laughs> I will tell it thee. Thou hast conversed with a young knight. Amazement. Who informed thee? Pent in her chamber, sickness has detained our abbess from the parlour. There I saw him oft as he came alone. He talked of love? He did. <laughs> Tis well. Tis the stranger I beheld this morning. He sorrows for a father. Something, too, he uttered of a large inheritance that should be his. Dost thou love this stranger? Yes, with such a love as I feel for thee. His earnest words sound like precepts of a tender parent, and next to thee, I think I could obey him. Be calm, my lovely orphan. Hush thy fears. Heaven knows how fondly, anxiously I love thee. The stranger's not to blame. Myself will task him and see if he deserves thee. Now, retire, nor slap thy duty to the expiring saint. <laughs> the dew of grace rest on this dwelling. Thanks, my ghostly friend. Or I mistake, in your sad eye, I spell affliction signature. To tutor my unapt and ill-schooled nature, you come then with doctrines and authority, if aught can medicate a soul unsound as mine. You mock my friendship and miscall my zeal. Learn the measure of your woes. Learn if the mother's fortitude can brave the bolt the woman's arrogance defy. The mother, said thou? Yes, imperious dame, on Buddha's plain thy slaughtered Edmund lies. An unbeliever's weapon cleft his heart. In the grave, thou sayest, my Edmund sleeps. How didst thou learn his fate? Priest, mock me not. Then you loved him. I loved him? Oh, nature bleeding at my heart, hearst thou this? Loved him? Ha! I am thy mistress yet, nor will I brook insolent reproof. Produce thy warrant, assure my Edmund's death, or dread his vengeance. My warrant is at hand. This gentleman beheld thy Edmund breathless on the ground. Huh. Is this sorcery, or is my husband? <laughs> Look up, all oh, ever dear. Behold thy son, it is thy Edmund's voice. Dumb still, I have killed her. My brain grows hot. My lord, restrain your passion. See, she revives. <laughs> Art thou or not a mother? Who, where am I? Why did you hold me? 
Was it not my Narbonne? Alas, she raves. Her whom? Quick, answer. Count of Narbonne, dost thou live? Madam, behold your son. He kneels for pardon. Distraction. What means this complicated scene of horrors? Art thou my husband, winged from other orbs to taunt my soul? Oh, what is this dubious form? Art thou my dead or my living son? I am thy living Edmund. Let these scalding tears attest the existence of thy suffering son. Oh, touch me not. How? In that cruel breast revive then all sensations except affection? But now, to thy eyes I seemed my father, at least for that resemblance sake, embrace me. Horror on horror, blasted be thy tongue. Lady, I doubt not your blessing, first obtained, and gracious pardon. He will obey your pleasure, and return to stranger climes. Tis false. I will not hence. Am I not Narbonne's prince? Who will banish me? Edmund, hear me. Thou art my son, and I will prove another. But I am thy sovereign too. This state is mine. Benedict, attend me. Tomorrow, Edmund, shalt thou learn my pleasure. Why, this is majesty. Commanding sex. Strength, courage, all our boasted attributes seems a borrowed ray when virtue deigns to speak with female organs. Yes, O oh my mother, I will learn to obey. Make but the blooming Adeliza mine, and bear of me unquestioned Narbonne scepter, till life's expiring lamp resumes its wasted oil no more. Till this hour I had not seen thy passions boil o'er the bounds of prudence. Mistake me not, good brother. I would not know one half that I suspect till I have acted as if not suspecting. Tis time enough to make up our account when we confess and kneel for absolution. Still does thy genius soar above mankind. How many fathers of our holy church in Benedict I view? No flattery, brother. Tis true, the church owes Benedict some thanks. For her, I forgot I am a man. Enemies to Rome are Benedict's foes. Interest bids us crush this cockatrice and her egg. Already to those vagrants she inclines, as if the rogues that preach reform to others, like idiots minded to reform themselves. Be cautious, brother. You may lose the lady. She is already lost. I cannot dupe and therefore must destroy her. How may this be accomplished? Ask me not. I guess her fatal secret. I tremble. Dastard, <laughs> tremble if we fail. Peace, daughter, peace. Nor when the lamb is nigh must eels wrangle. Why sighs that gentle bosom? Our holy father, the pious abbess is at peace. We go to bear her parting blessing to the countess. It must not be by me. She wills you restrain your steps within the cloister's pale, nor grant access but to one stranger knight. The countess commands. Huh. Adelisa, I charge thee guard thy convent. Wherefore then this disobedience? Madam, I was urging the fitness of your orders. No. I am the thing you made me. Crush me, spurn me, I will not murmur. Should you bid me die, I know it were meant in kindness. Bid thee die? My own detested life but lingers round thee. My child, retire, I am much discomposed. Be patient, lady. 
This fair domain thou know'st acknowledges the sovereignty of the church. Thy rebel son dares not attempt to give thee peace. There is no question of Lord Edmund. Leave us. I have to talk with her alone. Now tremble at voices supernatural and forfeit the spoils the tempest throws into our lap. Now, Adeliza, summon all thy courage, retrace my precepts past, nor let a tear profane a moment that's worth the martyrdom. The virgin veil shall guard my spotless hours, assure my peace, and saint me for hereafter. It cannot be. To Narbonne thou must bid a last adieu, and with the stranger knight depart a bride. Unhappy me! Too sure I have overburdened thy charity, if thou wouldst drive me from hence. Restrain oh. thy arms, dear lady. Adeliza, thou words now slaken, now augment my fever. Hear my last breath. Avoid the scorpion pleasure. Death lurks beneath the velvet of his lips. Oh, retrospect of horror. To the altar haste, Adeliza, vow thou wilt be wretched. Dost thou doom me to eternal sorrows? Hast thou deceived me? Oh, how she melts me. What have I said? Oh, lovely innocence, thou art my only thought. Oh, was I formed the child of sin, and I dare not embrace thee? Yet curse the hour that stamped thee with a being. Alas, was I born a child of sin? Who were my parents? I will pray for them. Oh, the bolt must come, let it strike me here. I'll praise thee from the earth. What is my lot? Wilt thou yet cherish me? Oh, canst thou doubt the conflict of the soul? Oh, just to shield thee from this world of so sorrows that thou must flee, must wed, must never view the towers of Narbonne more, must never know the doom reserved for thy sad patroness. Fly, ere my rage did forget distinction, nature, and make a medley of unheard of crimes. Fly, ere it be too late. Alas, she raves. I will call for help. She's gone. That pang, great God, was my last sacrifice. Now, recollect thyself. My soul consummate the pomp of horror with tremendous cruelness. Tis fit that reason punish passion's crime. A reason. Alas, tis one of my convulsions down. I sink lost in eternal torment. She is not here. Shall we not follow her? Thou knowst her not. Her transport is fictitious. No, I tremble for her life. Thou art young. I know this countess, an errant heretic. She scoffs the church. Her days are numbered, and thou shalt do wisely to quit her. Alas. She bids me go. She bids me wed the stranger knight that wooed me in our parlor. And thou shalt take her at her word. Myself will join your hands, and lo, in happy hour, who comes to meet her boon? In, in tears. That cowl shall not protect the injurious tongue that dare insult thy innocence. My gracious lord, yourself and virgin coyness must be chidden. Unriddled priest, my soul is too impatient to wait the impertinence of flowery dialect. <laughs> Dost thou consent, sweet passion of my soul? Forbear, it must not be. Thou shalt not wed a beggar. This orphan, this abandoned wanderer, taunted with poverty, with, with shameful origin? Lovely Adeliza, placed in your arms, can never feel affliction. This the good countess knows. By my sire's soul, I will not thank her. Has she dared scorn thee, thou beauteous excellence? In her very presence, I will espouse thee. By heaven, all's lost should they meet. Now, pray, be advised. Heaven knows how dear I tender your felicity. The chapel is a few paces hence. 
Arrived there, I will speedily pronounce a few solemn words. Well, be it so. My fair one, this holy man advises well. Yes. Heaven, to thee I fly. Thou art my only refuge. The business is dispatched. Their hands are joined. The puling Moppet struggled with her wishes, invoked each saint to witness her refusal, nor heeded, though I swore their golden hearts were tuned to greet her hymenal hours. The impetuous Count would forerun the rites. The maid, affrighted, at such tumultuous, unaccustomed onset, sunk lifeless on the pavement. Thus am I revenged, proud dame of Narbonne low. A barefoot monk thus pays thy scorn, thus vindicates his altars. Ah, oh, woe of woe! Good father, haste thee in and speak sweet words of comfort to our mistress. Her brain is much disturbed. Good man, exorcist, thy pains are unavailing. Her sins press her. Guilt has unhinged her reason. She raves upon her son and thinks he came in vision. Twas no vision. How? He has spoken with her. Go to, it could not be. I tell thee, Edmund, thy quantum master's son has seen his mother. Oh, joyous sounds! Where is my noble lord? Here, and undone. These sixteen years has my friend Edmund pined in banishment, while masses, mummings, Goblins and processions usurped his heritage and made of Narbonne a theater of holy interludes and sainted frauds? But day darts on these spells. The enlightened day eschews such vile deceits, and truth shall do mankind and Edmund justice. I dare not shoot the gulf. How, Benedict, thou art a priest, thy mission should be holy. Quick, do thy work. It is not the wound, it is the consequence. Oh, split my heart at this sad sight. Stand off, thou art an accomplice. Madam, it was your morning's gracious pleasure that I should attend you. Huh? Who art thou? Have you forgotten me, lady? <laughs> A memory is full, a head destruct, as mine can hold only two objects, guilt and eternity. He is returned. Your son, have you not seen him? Would I had never. This villainous monk has stepped betwixt you and nature and misreported of the noblest gentleman that treads on Christian ground. Are you a mother? Ye saints, this was the demon prompted it. Avaunt! He beckons me. I will not. Lies my lord not wounded in the pot, I'll tear my hair and bathe his wounds. My strength, my reason fail, darkness surrounds me, let me die here. This is too much for art. No, tis fictitious all. Twas I inspired the horrors she has been so kind to utter at my suggestion. Artful woman, thou subtle emblem of thy sex, composed of madness and deceit, but since thy brain has lost its poise, I will send those shall shake it beyond recovery of its reeling bias. This interval is well. Tis my last boon, tremendous providence, and I will use it as will the elixir of descending mercy. A woman's words, a mother's woe, but honour, if I believe thy garb is thy profession. A soldier's honour is his virtue. A soldier and his honour exist together, and together perish. Tis enough. Nor suffer the ebbing moments more inquiry. Adeliza, my orphan, shall be thine. Nay, stop not, sir. Your loves are known to me. I love Adeliza? <laughs> Lady, recall thy wandering mind. Though the licentious camp and rapine's holiday have been my school, deem me not so reprobate my morals that my eye would not 
distance between the harlot's gaze and my friend's bride. Thy, thy friend? What friend? Lord Edmund. What of him? Is Adeliza's lord, her wedded bridegroom. Confusion! <laughs> Frenzy! Blast me, all ye furies! Edmund and Adeliza, when? Where? How, Edmund and Adeliza? Quick on, say the monstrous tale. Oh, prodigy, you have ruined us, my own son, then boil with fiercer fires than scorched his impious mother's madding veins? What means his agony? Didst thou not grant the maiden to his wishes? Did I not couple distinctions horrible? Plan unnatural rites to grace my funeral pile and meet the furies? Amazement. Will hasten, grant ye powers, my speed be not too late. Dear parent, look on us and bless us as your children. <laughs> My children? Horror! Horror, yes, ye are my children. Edmund, loose that hand! There's no poison, tis poison to thy soul. Hell has no venom like a child's touch. Oh, agonizing thought! Who made this marriage? Whose unhallowed breath pronounced the incestuous sounds? Incest? Good heavens! <laughs> yes, thou devoted victim, let thy blood curdle to stone. Perdition circumvent thee. Oh, where this monster stands, thy mother, mistress, mother of thy Daughter, sister, wife, the pillar of accumulated horrors, hear and tremble. Yes, I do tremble, though thy words are frenzy. So black must be the passions that inspire it. Oh, Edmund, I have burst the bond of every tie when thou shalt know the fullness of my crimes to which this fury did involve thy youth. It will seem piety to curse me. Edmund, oh, impious knight, oh, is not that my lord? He shakes the curtains of the nuptial couch and starts to find a son there. Gracious heaven, grant that these shocking images be raving. Sweet lady, be composed. Benedict shall discharge our vows. Oh, for a short interval, give me reason, heaven. It must be known the fullness of my crime. Ye know how fondly my luxurious fancy doted upon my lord. For eighteen months an embassy detained him from my bed. A harbinger announced his near return. Love dressed his image to my longing thoughts in all its warmest colours. But the morn, in which impatience grew almost to sickness, presenting him a bloody corpse before me, I raved. The storm of disappointed passion severed all my reason, assailed all my blood. Whether too warmly pressed or too officious to turn the tide of grief aside, Beatrice, that attended me, disclosed thy suit, unhappy boy. What is to come? Shield me, ye gracious powers, from my own thoughts. My fancy saw thee thy father's image. Swallow the accursed sound, nor dare to say. Yes, thou polluted son. Grief, disappointment. Opportunity raised such a tumult in my madding blood, I took Beatrice's place. And while thy arms twine to thy thinking round another's waist, hear hell and tremble, thou didst clasp thy mother. <coughs> oh, execrable! <laughs> Be that swoon eternal. 
nor let her know the rest. She is thy daughter, fruit of that monstrous night. Infernal woman, my dagger must repay a tale like this. No, I must not strike. I dare not punish what you dare commit. Oh, give me the dagger, my arm will not recoil. Master Edmund, I revenge thee. Help! Oh, help! Peace and conceal our shame. Quick, frame some legend. Has this the maid an accident? Oh. Mercy! Heaven! Who did this deed? Myself. What was the cause? Follow me to yon gulf, and thou shalt know I answer not to man. Bethink thee, lady. Thought ebbs apace. Oh, Edmund, could a blessing break from my lips and not become a curse, I would. Poor Adeliza, tis accomplished. My lord, explain these horrors. Wherefore fell your mother, and why faints your wife? My wife? Thou damned priest, I have no wife, thou knowst it. Thou gavest me a deed. No, rot my tongue ere the dread sound escape it. Bear away that hateful monk. Who was the prophet now? Remember me. Oh, Florian, we, we must haste to where fell war must war assumes its ugliest form. I, I, I burn to rush on death, O oh, tender friend. I, I must not violate thy guiltless ear. <laughs> ha! Tis my father calls. I, I dare not see him compose. My lord, where all your friends, let us comfort your gentle bride. No! Forbid it, all ye powers. O oh, Florian, bear, bear her to the holy sisters. Say, t'was my mother's will, she take the veil. I never must behold her. Never more review this theater of monstrous guilt. No, to the embattled foe I will present this hated form. Welcome be the saber that leaves no atom of it undefaced. private, double entendres my strict virtue drive at. Your muses, sir, are not more free from ill on Mount Parnassus or on Strawberry Hill. And though with her repentance you may hum one, I would not play your countess to become one. So very guilty and so very good, an angel with such errant flesh and blood. Such sinning, praying, preaching, I'll be kissed if I don't think she was a Methodist. <laughs> Saints are the produce of a vicious age. Crimes must abound ere sectaries can rage. His mask no canting confessor assumes, with acted zeal no flaming bigot fumes. Till the rich harvest nods with the swelling grain, and the sharp sickle can assure his gain. But soon shall hypocrites their sight deplore, nor grim enthusiast vex Britannia more. Virtue shall guard her daughters from their arts, shine in their eyes, and blossom in their hearts. They need no lectures in fantastic tone. Their lesson lives before them on the throne. to introduce you our fabulous cast, Georgina Locke as the Countess of Marbon, <laughs> Carlos um, Guanche as Edmund, <laughs> Gilbert 
Marco Sanz as Florian. <laughs> Chelsea Phillips as Adeliza. <laughs> Charlie Gillespie as Benedict. <laughs> Justin Crisp as uh, Friar Martin. Gail Townsend as Peter the Porter. Stephen Clark as the servant. <laughs> and Dale Worrell, I'm D Dale, David Worrell as uh, the, who has a Bridge Star text. In the audience. And well, also Jill Campbell, who has read our prologue. <laughs> and finally, Misty Anderson. And we're going to do a talk back in just a few minutes. We're going to just do a quick bring out some chairs, so please stay for that. And some of our actors will need to go hang up these very hot clothes, but they will come back in for the discussion. And we're planning on maybe 20 minutes uh, in, in here, and then uh, we'd like you to join us at a reception after. Yes. Thank you. All right. Come on in. Um, while, the, while the cast is, um, is getting changed, we can get started. Um, uh, I'm Catherine Sheehy, I'm the, the resident dramaturg of Yale Rep, and I'm the chair of the uh, Department of Dramaturgy and Dramatic Criticism at the Yale School of Drama, and um, an 18th century uh, British enthusiast. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you here to uh, a talk back. I, uh, I want to share with you, uh, uh, I'll ask a couple of questions, and then, and then I'll throw it open to you, um, just so that because we're recording it, uh, there are uh, standers by with microphones, so when, when you're called upon, uh, if you would just uh, contain your enthusiasm until the microphone can get to you, that'd be great. Um, I wanted to read you just a little bit from uh, Horace Walpole's postscript to the eight, uh, 1791 edition, which is about 23 years after the play was originally written. From the time that I first undertook the foregoing scenes, I never flattered myself that they would be proper to appear on the stage. The subject so horrid that I thought it would shock rather than give satisfaction to the audience. Still, I found it so truly tragic in the essential springs of terror and pity that I could not resist the impulse of adapting it to the scene, though it could never be practicable to produce it there. <laughs> I saw too, see? Uh, see how wrong you can be 300 years later. I saw too that, um, uh, that it would admit of great situation, of lofty characters, and of those sudden and unforeseen strokes which have often singular effect in operating a revolution in the passions and an interest in the spectator. It was capable of furnishing not only a contrast of characters, but a contrast of virtue and vice in the same character, sitting right there. Um, and by laying the scene in what age and what country I pleased, Catholic France, uh, pictures of ancient manners might be drawn and many allusions to historic events introduced to bring the action nearer the imagination of the spectator. The moral resulting from the calamities attendant on unbounded passions, obviously the moral of the story, even to the destruction of the criminal's race, was obviously suited to the purpose and object of tragedy. So I thought that would be a good place for us to start, uh, since we have some scholars up here. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, is The Mysterious Mother a tragedy? Uh, what is the play's purpose and object, would you say? And um, I'll be happy to throw it out to anybody who's, uh, who'd like to answer. Well, I, I think there's a, there's a kind of um, textual fault line in the play when we, con when we conceptualize it as a tragedy. On the one hand, he mentions Aristotelian categories of pity and terror, mm -hmm. and harking back to an Aristotelian understanding of tragedy in the postscript that you've just read. But on the other hand, as the uh, prologue to the piece makes clear, he is trying to differentiate himself from classicism and indeed French neoclassicism of the 18th century which subscribes to Aristotelian models of tragedy and in fact holds Shakespeare responsible for deviating from those and seeing him as kind of gothic and barbaric and um, uncouth and uncivilized because he doesn't conform to notions of tragedy. So I think the play's relationship to tragedy is complex. On the one hand, citing pity and terror as the wellspring Aristotelian categories, but on the other hand, 
differentiating himself certainly from neoclassical conceptualizations of tragedy. Therefore, Shakespeare asserts him as the kind of guide and the model to a tragic mode. Uh, and the play is replete with references to Macbeth, to Hamlet in particular. Uh, I think those are his, the models to which he turns, bearing in mind that for the 18th century, Shakespeare is the Gothic bard, Gothic in, in a very different sense, mm -hmm. but yes. Mm -hmm. So essentially, an Englishman wanted to let, let us know that the French got it wrong. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's very odd. As he does in the, in the preface to a transfer. Right. Yes. Um, Walpole actually courted comparisons to Shakespeare as his literary as his literary target of aspiration, as Jill as Jill read in, in, in the prologue. And uh, here he's taken that old Shakespearean chestnut, the bed trick, and he's inverted it right uh, as the seed of disaster rather than the way to the comic uh, resolution, as it is in All's Well and somewhat less merrily in Measure for Measure. Um, uh, how, what's it? Uh, maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, describing the bed trick and and uh, Georgina and and what. Uh, what kind of emotions that you go through while you're while you're uh, imagining that old the, chestnut? The bed trick. Um, well, um, I don't have a son, but I've got quite a good imagination. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, you know, I, I kind of like the lines where she's moving between uh, loving what she sees as a son. And at the same time, being disgusted, loving what she's the husband and being disgusted by her son, it was quite an interesting uh, uh, position to be in. And I suppose that it's, I mean, I, I can't really think of anything worse to do apart from murder, you know. So I'm in a very difficult place, really. And I also think it's slightly weird to sleep with somebody the night that somebody dies anyway. But um, <laughs> so I. I did find it quite difficult to, to get in to her from the inside, but the more I read the script and the more I um, kind of read the language of the script and the things about <coughs> guilt and innocence and uh, the, the kind of the rhetoric that she uses, it, it helped me to, to, to kind of use the script to kind of portray what she's going through. And then sometimes you start to feel it. And actually where I... What I used to try to get closer to it, I mean, I, we talked about our, the spine, didn't we, Wistie, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, keeping the spine very straight and then bending. The idea of being disgusted by yourself, your stomach starts to kind of shrink and wants to kind of vomit by the idea of what you've done. Mm -hmm. And that actually, that kind of physical clue helped me with, uh, with getting, uh, getting closer to, to that. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, let's call it a sin. It's a sin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This also sort of touches on, uh, you know, many moments of nervous laughter, as you might imagine. And we, we only got together on Monday night for the first time. So, um, uh, but we, we sort of had to speed through the process. And in thinking about this sort of the, the, the horrific bed trick, we're also back to your first question in a way, Catherine, you know, is this a tragedy, the over-the-topness of it, which is also something that, especially for those scholars in the room who teach Otranto um, to undergraduates, you know, mm -hmm. is, is this funny when the helmet falls, right, and, and crushes the sun? There's something, something absurd uh, around the corner, mm -hmm. so... Um, we, d we are preparing a musical version. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have lots of Mamma Mia. The all, the, all, the all tap dancing mysterious Absolutely. mother. Yeah. Um, Wapple said that he never flattered himself that the play would be proper to appear on the stage, and setting aside the unlikelihood that he never flattered himself. Uh, <laughs> did, did, did you find the play stage worthy for today's louche, depraved audience? Mm -hmm. Like these people here, um, and, and how did you make? How did you make it? How did you go about making it stage worthy? Mm -hmm. Maybe you guys could. I mean, because well, I think that's the, thing, you know, the thing that I yeah. did, of course, it, you know, because it starts out as a five-act Shakespearean play, it doesn't mm -hmm. be, you know, it's Shakespearean shape, and so I realised that you know you wouldn't want to stay around for two hours or something like that. So we needed to get it down. So I, so so I had to cut it and the idea which is brutal but then I found a, a performance after Walpole's death where it had been performed as three acts mm. so I knew it was safe it could be cut and I guess I thought probably it should be cut <laughs> you know as well so so that's what I did and so I um, th threw out things really so what you're really doing is trying to end with the final scene so it's a bit like 
landing an aircraft, I think. There's a landing strip, which is the final, you know, the final scene with the Countess, and you have to throw out all the luggage and the drinks trolley <laughs> and, the, and everything in order to be able to reach that. And so that, but the, an interesting thing began to happen as I worked through it, which is that once you throw out all the positives and you accent all the negatives, like the reverse of the song, you know, uh, you know um, the, what you get then is this kind of melodramatic line which seems to go through it. So, you know, so if you like, it's kind of ideologies freighted on this line of um, melodrama, actually, you know, interaction, with, with, which you hope that this uh, uh, cutting is kind of done, really. So, and it's interesting that it's there at all. So, because you can see Horace kind of making melodrama out of, you know, as a, as a kind of, again, a spine going through it, even though the play's probably about other things, you know, profound things about guilt and, you know, um, religion and all those things. But that line seems to go all the way through it as I kind of work through it and shortened it. Yeah, and in our early conversations, um, when you mentioned melodrama, and we have a wonderful uh, lighting design candidate uh, at, at my home university, uh, Alice Trent, and she uh, she did these um, uh, these graphics for us, and um, uh, so that got me thinking not just about melodrama as the over the topness, but also um, might music do some work. Uh, and to supply what had to be cut here. And a lot of what had to be cut, I see uh, Charlie and, and Justin are back, um, is the, the religious struggle that, uh, that Walpole is staging here, you know, imagining this, uh, this early Reformation or almost pre-Reformation moment and coming back and so all of these zingers about an enlightened age and reason um, are also in the context of uh, a very fascinating kind of anti, uh, anti-clericalism that it is also yeah. a fascination um, mm -hmm. you know with with all things Catholic and with a, a kind of pre-modern past uh, so we were just you know looking for ways to give that feel even though those uh, debates in the play and those those lines which are very interesting might not be the most playable Mm -hmm. yeah. To get back to the notion of disgust that mm -hmm. you picked up, which I think is, is hugely important and interesting in this play, um, is to look at how that term for Walpole, certainly in the context of this play, is inseparable from a, um, a perception of female sexuality. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. seems to happen in the um, correspondence around the play that he undertakes particularly with his friend Mason is a concern with disgust. And it's quite clear that that disgust pertains to the fact that this is a woman who has not unconsciously committed a tragic error, but someone who desires, who is desiring, and who is a kind of sexual agent, and who chooses voluntarily and consciously her son as a bed partner. Mm -hmm. And it is that element of disgust that Mason suggests he rewrite out of the play and turn it into an unconscious, tragic mistake. But it's quite clear that, 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 that the issue around disgust pertains to Walpole, for Walpole to a consciously, um, deliberately desiring woman which, I, woman, which I think he has difficulties conceptualizing, as of course many in the late 18th century do. Mm -hmm. so. Is it about uh, that women can't be trusted as well, especially when they're sexually powerful? You know, they're there's kind that, of but there's also, that women you know, play. in the history of sexuality, it's only at around this time that women are being given a sexuality of their mm -hmm. own anyway, mm -hmm. and not seen simply as inverted, uh, desiring, bodies, uh, design bodies that uh, have sort of organs and desires that are simply inverted versions of the masculine. But the two-sex model of desiring arises in the late 18th yeah. century where women are kind of bestowed with their own sexuality. And that, that is, I think, enormously threatening for someone like And, and these are words that Edmund uses. He calls yeah. his mother a sensual woman. Yeah. And um, it refers to organs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Think so. Yeah. And things are. such a play is never done until the bodies of the women are strewn on the stage mm -hmm. and then look supremely sorry. I think we should, I think we should, open, I think we should open up.
think we should open up the, the, for questions from the audience if there, if there are any. I mean, I have some more, but I don't want to usurp your, your uh, curiosity. And we do have the remainder of the cast back in the yeah. room if and you have questions. They can take questions too as well. Yeah. Yes, right here. Well, um, yes, I was quite intrigued by this um, uh, issue of female se sexuality and, and lust on which the whole plot turns, obviously. And is this treated in other literary works at the time? Or is it treated, I don't know, from the pulpit? Is it treated in philosophical uh, writings at the time? I mean, forgive me, I don't know, I don't know much about it, but it just, <laughs> it, it yes, hits you. Yes, most definitely. Hits you in the face. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you can, I think you can see in Gertrude, too. I mean, in Hamlet, you know, just yeah. talk about Hamlet. You, you, that kind of, the deep suspicion of, 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 of a woman, who, particularly a woman of a certain age, who continues to desire. You've been through the restoration with people like, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Lovett in, in uh, Man of Moe, and this kind of, you know, the, the older woman's sexuality is, is almost like a, it's like a, it's like a deathbed for, for male scenes, you know what I mean? And, and it's seen as a kind of problem, you know? I think that starts on the Renaissance stage, on the Shakespearean stage. <laughs> But yeah. in, in, in the age as well, he, he, um, he, um, so sometime in the 1780s, there's a play called The Mysterious Husband, uh -huh. and that's about incest as well, but in not quite the same way. And the storyline in that is that, um, yeah, the father has a mistress, the, the English father has a mistress in Paris, mm -hmm. and then his adult son, who is estranged from the father, goes to Paris, and he takes up with the mistress, unbeknownst to each other. So, so there's a kind of, a, you know, I guess in, in that period, you know, they're exploring the limits of incest. So, so London audiences, you know, kind of comfortable with thinking about that, I think, you know, and or perhaps they're exploring, I mean, you know, they're probably other incest plays of the 18th century, I don't know. Right. Dryden's yeah. Oedipus, for right. example. Yeah. But um, it, it, this notion of the kind of dangerously desiring woman would become a staple of Gothic fiction in the late 18th mm -hmm. century, and almost invariably to catastrophic dramatic ends. Mm -hmm. um, one thinks of, from Anne Radcliffe right through to Charlotte Dacre mm -hmm. and, and beyond, these images of, of passion, uh, the word that they become associated with is passion. Mm -hmm which has both sentimental overtones but also sexual overtones in the period. And just thinking specifically about the stage, I mean, it's at the Restoration that we have women playing women's parts for the first time in English theatre. And uh, Restoration comedies, those, those comedies between 1660 and, and about 1700 are, are known for being especially uh, uh, sexually frank, dirty, there's lots of adultery, there's lots of sleeping around, uh, and that sort of all comes on in a, in a burst after uh, Charles II reopens the theaters, after the Puritans had closed them. So there's a kind of cultural revenge plot on the Puritans that's going on, right? Yay, Puritans are gone, we can have sexy comedies. Um, but also women's bodies on the stage. And then, um, you know, that, that, that peak dies down, but we still have some of those types. Um, that are, are part of, again, discovering what the stage does when women are embodying women. But what is interesting, too, is taking the, the, the bed trick from that bawdy tradition, mm -hmm. that comic bawdy tradition mm -hmm. of, say, William Witchley, yeah. and then repurposing it to, mm -hmm. to tragic ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too that you, if you think about the, the you know, the theater in London was was a commercial idea, and the people who began to have money were, of course, then the merchant class, and the merchant class wanted to see themselves on stage, and then they aspired to the toys of the aristocracy, but with the morals of the of the bourgeoisie, and and so you get fetishization, and I think the sentimental comedy goes a long way toward the gothic. I mean, and you get, you know, I think this is kind of like this, you know, you get the conscious lovers, and then you just put it on amphetamines, and you get the mysterious mother. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Stephen. Yeah. Um, is there not a is there not a contrast between the absolutely fundamental issue of disgust and fear of female sexuality, which one suspects has real personal res relevance or resonance rather for all of them, and the other being sort of obvious theme that comes out in terms of Catholicism and anti-Catholicism? which is infinitely more layered. 
and where he seems to be using it as a trope, as it were, and you, it's, it's, it's a device which he uses and to, in order to achieve dramatic effect. And it, it's, it's mechanism, it's not felt. Mm -hmm. mm. I think that's a good question. And were Charlie Gillespie down here, I would make him answer it. Um, but the, um, you know, yeah, I think that that's an important distinction. Um, whatever disgust is, is particular to Walpole and his, uh, you know, his, his possible sexuality and his disgust um, at, at the idea of women uh, and the, uh, the religious uh, debate that's playing out here. But I think they intersect in Benedict, you know. Um, the, uh, you know, for, for Rome, I have forgot I am a man, right? You know, and, and a kind of an outsider-ness um, to, uh, to heterosexuality. But I, I think the difference is that in relation to Catholicism, Walpole can never safely adopt an unequivocal attitude of disgust in the way that he can mm -hmm. in relation to, to, to femininity. It's, it's much more ambivalent in relation to Catholicism, not least of all because of Catholicism's architectural heritage oh. that he's deliberately courting yes. at Strawberry Hill. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a very um, problematic um, attempt in Walpole to distinguish between the aesthetics of Catholicism and its, its um, theological legacy. So it's, it's, uh, the disgust is never as, as, as abject in mm -hmm. relation to Catholicism. It's, it's always part of the by it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, I would say, but, at least at the architectural and aesthetic mm. level, obsessed. Mm. But I think you can just see it also as anti French as well, you know, which is yes. you know, a feeling of the period. And so mm -hmm. if you go through that as a line, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's. But, that you know, becomes, it, it becomes a, yeah, you know, explorable. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and again, that would. So the mysterious husband, you know, the, the mistress is in Paris. You know, that would mm. be. Mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. kind of thing going on in 18th century England where the French are the enemy. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we read the prologue and the epilogue that Walpole wrote for his own play. And the bit that I read, he wrote imagining Kitty Clive doing it, and then takes that jab at Methodists as well. So I said, of course I have to take this. Um, the, uh, but I, I think that they are, again, we're coming back to a, um, uh, of the religious context, and we can't undersell that, even if we had to leave yeah. some of that on the cutting room floor to get this yes. play in this space. Mm -hmm. How did you get together a cast from so many different places? <laughs> Persistence. <laughs> we planned ahead. And uh, I, I twisted arms in many cases in Cindy, Cindy Roman too, and we put, to, put our heads together and thought about people who have a connection to the Lewis Walpole Library and people who might be uh, available and around and um, folks were so generous with their time. Joe Roach helped me find those fantastic uh, young men. Carlos is here and uh, Gilberto had to go. So we, uh, we, we wove it together and we did truly just get together for the first time on Monday night. I think we could take and one more question. Yes, right here. Thank you. Um, I noticed that the actress who played Eliza is, is right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to ask a, a, a question of her. Um, Walpole was most unhappy with, with Eliza, wasn't he? He did, he did say that he was, he's not so happy. He really loved to play mm -hmm. his own play, but he, he did say that he thought the character hadn't come out quite right. And there's really very little for you to do. <laughs> yeah. so what it's like doing so little. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, can everybody hear me if I don't use the mic? No, no. Oh, wait, any, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it, it is a bit hard, and in part because of the, the wonderful cutting that David gave us, which is really very playable. Um, she does tend to, I sort of have this pattern where I come on and I kneel and I cry, <laughs> and, um, and then I leave, and I'm usually confused by what's happening on stage around me. Um, so it's true, there, there isn't a lot to do, but actually as I, as I was able to watch us sort of move through the whole arc of the story over the last couple of days, I started to realize more and more. And I think there is something very relatable about the fact that um, Adeliza is so dependent on the Countess for sort of everything in her life, yeah. including all of her sort of emotional well-being. And so when the Countess starts to break down, uh, I think there seems to be a lot of inconsistency in Adelaide. Is she excited about getting married? Does she not want to get married? Is she, does she want to become a nun? Does she like 
this mysterious young man that she's met. It's unclear, but I think what it ultimately comes down to is that she wants to please the Countess. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the Countess is telling her, including doom yourself by getting married, <laughs> she's going to say, okay, I'll do that. So. Again, I, 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 to mention the Countess Lovers again, you know, you think of Indiana. You know, yes. There's always this, the, the, the orphan who is revealed to, to have either the key to happiness or the key to ruin um, in, 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 the, in the play. I think I think uh, we we want to release you to the to the reception and the wine and the cheese and the and the congratulating the actors as you as you encounter them in the room. But thank you very much for for staying. Yeah, thank you.